welcome to another episode of the BS Podcast, the show that looks at how behavioral change insights are being applied in the wild. Episodes feature renowned behavioral experts across industries and organizations, from management and marketing to policy and public health, and more. Let's dive in and see what all the BS is about. Here's your host from The Behaviorist, Nick Hobson. Mike Norton is the Harold M. Brearley Professor of Business Administration at the Harvard Business School and a member of Harvard's Behavioral Insights Group, or BIG. He holds a BA in Psychology and English from Williams College and a PhD in Psychology from Princeton University. Prior to joining HBS, Mike was a fellow at the MIT Media Lab and MIT's Sloan School of Management. He is the co-author, along with Elizabeth Dunn, of the book, Happy Money, The Science of Smarter Spending. His TEDx talk, How to Buy Happiness, has been viewed more than 4 million times. And I don't know if you know this, Mike, but it just crept over that 4 million mark, it seems, not too long ago. So that's exciting. Um, And uh, at HBS, he is the course head for the first year MBA course, Field Foundations, and heads the Strategic Marketing Management Executive Program. Oh, I'm out of breath. Mike, welcome to the show. Just to be clear, the, the four million was um, I just paid Twitter bots to do that. So, <laughs> I, in fact, it's only four. But you know, it's pretty cheap now to do. So, I recommend it. <laughs> there you go. Well, next up, five million. Mm-hmm. <laughs> well, um, great to uh, great to have you on, Mike. And for those for those listening, we uh, we have a past together. We are collaborators, co-authors. When I was a, uh, a really young, naive, foolish, nervous, angsty, young graduate student, PhD student, I was introduced to Mike through my mentor, Mickey Inslicht. And I came in really with uh, not knowing what I was going to do. And, Rich, and, and Mickey said, hey, how do you feel about rituals? And because uh, you had just published your paper in 2012, a couple of those papers in 2012, 2012. Um, and I said, Hey, sure. Yeah, why not? And then that sort of led for the next, I don't know, for the next four or five, six years of us doing this work together on, on rituals and led to a couple of publications. And what's really neat is where I still get to, now that I'm outside of academia, I still have a foot in that world and still get to publish. And I'm, I'm working with you and a couple others on, on this project. And I, I think the last time we spoke, we were designing a study where we were trying to look at religious people's reactions, um, specific, something to do with a circumcision ritual. Is that right, Mike? <laughs> Let's see. Or the, I mean, it might have just been a private conversation we were having, uh, but <laughs> maybe you play to them. By the way, the backstory, when I ch- was chatting with Mickey about rituals, and you may have seen yourself as shy and awkward, but Mickey said, I have an amazing new student who I think we should work on this with. So oh, the that- actual true story is is more in line with that. But back to circumcision. <laughs> yeah, I think I think that's exactly what we did, which was we were trying to think of rituals that maybe have some possible harm and yet people still seem to think it's very very important to do them. Like a lot of rituals there's there's no harm. I, I mean, I may as well knock wood three times because who cares? But some of them actually could have actual physical harm. And we thought, what an interesting case of rituals where people are willing to incur cost in order to enact these rituals that are very meaningful to them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we have a a great PhD student, Dan Stein at uh, UC Haas, who's working on it, who's leading it really. And we just sort of hop on a phone every now and then to, to to talk to him about it. And uh, I believe that the findings were in line with what we predicted. And even though people admit that, oh, I think it was the, the setup was, hey, look, we're going to um, put in place these practices that are more um, sa- that are safer and more, you know, uh, hygienic. Um, but of course, that changes the whole sequence of the ritual. Are you in line with this? And they say, well, it's yeah, it's better. However, I still hate you for trying to, you know, uh, alter the steps of this very holy and sacred ritual that I have. Yeah, the, the example that I always use is... Um the loading the dishwasher where every member of a couple believes the other person is loading the dishwasher completely incorrectly. (laughs) Neither person actually knows how to load it correctly. You know, there's a manual or something that tells you that nobody's ever read, but we each believe very strongly that our way is right. And even when confronted with evidence that there's a better way, 
like, no, no, I promise this way will be better or safer or cause less harm. We don't care. We just like to do it the way we've been doing it because it's important to us. It's meaningful to us. Sometimes it's how our parents did it and how our family does it. And we really just don't want to let these, these things go. And you could see it as irrational, I, I guess, or you could see it as this is really important to people. Like it's a, it's a big part of their identity. It's a big part of their life. And in some cases, history, why would we tell them to change when it's so important to them? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I think you've been peering in on my, uh, my marriage because I think we, my wife and I get in an argument about uh, loading the dishwasher all every week. And uh, it's, it's something that we can't give up. We keep fighting about it. So I think that's something for something to be said right there. I'm going to um, say some research I've been doing that is one of those projects where people say, I can't believe that anybody's paying that guy to do that, <laughs> I'm gonna yeah, say it anyway, <laughs> which is we've literally interviewed couples about the dishwasher in particular. <laughs> and the, it is, it, it's crazy. The number of couples that truly will say he does it wrong. She does it wrong, whatever. And uh, the typical biggest argument for whatever reason is, do the bulls go on the top shelf, <laughs> top rack, or on the bottom rack? Bulls on the top, that's, that's blasphemy. That's yeah, absolutely exactly. blasphemy. It's like a divide in the world, you know, between top, top rack and bottom rack people. Uh, you can't predict it. You know, it's not like men, women, sexual orientation, religion. Nothing seems to predict mm. what, where you do it. But once you do it that way, you just can't imagine what kind of a fool – would put the bowls on the top rack. I feel like that should be some sort of like pre-screening survey on the dating apps. I think it would be, how tall are you? Let's match on height. And let's also maybe match on dishwasher. Yeah. That's probably all we need. Are you a top bowl or a bottom bowl kind of thing, you know? <laughs> <laughs> um, so now my my job is to take, you say like, and I do miss asking these sorts of questions in the in the type of research that, that you know, academics get to do. But So my job is now, how do I go to my clients and leverage the insights of the circumcision ritual to make it useful for them in their business. So that's the uh, that's the next challenge for me. Yeah, it's interesting with rituals because the word itself, it conjures up kind of um, religious rituals, number one, and also sort of large, communal, very established, you know, thousand year old rituals. And so when you say the word in conversation, people are instantly, of course, thinking of those sorts of things, which then makes it strange to say, uh, and this can be relevant in your everyday life because people are wondering how, mm -hmm. but, but the, the work that we've done with all of our collaborators, you know, suggests that rituals can be really local. They can be private to even one individual. Uh, they can be completely made up uh, in a sense or new for a person and yet pretty quickly come to have a lot of meaning. And we know that because we've, we've all done it in our lives. Like we've all uh, worn socks or something and then our team won, and then we wear those socks forever. Like we just needed one instance of socks being associated with team winning. Mm -hmm. And then the rest of our life, we wear the socks. And we know it from any team we've been on where before we start, we do a thing that's different from every other team. And it's not like in an ancient text. It's something the coach made up. And yet it's our ritual right away and the other team has a stupid ritual and it's going to help us win. So they're really actually much more flexible, I think, than we typically think. And I think that includes you and me because I think we thought at first we were studying these ancient practices and we learned over time actually, no, that we can actually instantiate them in people like right now if we wanted to. Yeah. And that's, you know, to the chagrin of of probably the anthropologists in the room who who think that they are, you know, we should reserve the word, the term ritual for these big big behaviors, you know, ritual with a capital R, but I think, you know, as us as psychologists and behavioral scientists who are more of the mindset that it's, it is, it, there's a common underlying psychology that leads to, you know, the, the rituals with a capital R in religion and culture that have, you know, these ancient practices, but it's the same psychology with these like more ritual with the lowercase R, the ritual like behaviors that we see everywhere and, and anywhere humans are humans. And I, I go into, you know, and I actually bring this to, to clients and it's part of the work that I do. Um, and they go, hmm, rituals. And they're like, I don't really see it. And so now it's my job to go in and do like, say, like a you know, lunch and learn or a, a workshop session and, and convince them that it is in fact. And then, you know, if I've done a good job of that, of, 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 of talking to them in this discussion, they come out on the other side going, 
wow, yeah, I didn't think like I do do these things or my customers probably do these things. And we should understand what those behaviors are so that we can sort of track them and understand the buying decisions that are happening. And that's for me, you know, I love obviously my biases. <laughs> I love rituals. I think they're so fascinating. I think it's a window into human human behavior and human consciousness. Um, and I think it's, you know, our job now to to show that to others, to show that to people who, who you know, the non-science people and, and the, the folks in, in organizations and consumer behavior. Yeah, one of the ways that I um, have, have tried to sort of translate what, what we mean by rituals is to ask people, it's kind of a silly question, but I think it's, it's helpful is because most people say, I don't do, I don't have any rituals, you know, mm -hmm. that's not for me. But uh, super simple question in, in the morning when you're getting ready, do you brush your teeth and then shower or do you shower and then brush your teeth? <laughs> Which one? Me. Well, let me think yeah. now. I definitely brush teeth at the very last, but that's the last thing I do. And the reason is because coffee or orange juice, but mostly coffee with like mint aftertaste is just disgusting. So it has yeah. to be the last thing I do. That's my rationale. Yeah. So here's what's crazy is that, it, and I'm not exaggerating, asking this, ask it in any audience in the world. And it's almost always exactly 50, 50. Really? So, and half of people brush and then shower and half shower and then brush. Your argument is the classic one for your, your order. <laughs> the brush then shower one is I don't want to take a shower with gross morning breath, <laughs> which totally makes sense too. Right? I mean, that's not wrong either. Yeah. So yeah. you have this thing that you do kind of every morning forever. Mm. And uh, it, for many people, it matters. So the second question I ask is, okay, so now in your head, imagine I made you do it in the other order tomorrow morning. Mm -hmm. Does it bother you or do you not care at all? I would definitely care. And I, this is me coming across as the, uh, an extremely logical, atheist, rational, cold you know, computer person. And, and, and even that would, would bother me. Yeah. And, and then it kind of um, messes up your day. So yeah. often I, I can watch when people simulate it, they kind of like cringe a little bit, you know, like, yeah. ah, I yeah. just don't want. And, and if I said why, you know, you really, it, it's hard to judge. It's not like you did it a thousand times one way, a thousand times another way. It got the data and decided which one's better. It mm -hmm. just feels like the way that I want to start my day. Is that a ritual like 2000 years of history? No, of course not. But is it something that actually creates meaning for people and can help them in the terrible thing of having to get ready to go to work that we all have to do? If it helps you a little bit, feel a little readier to confront the day, I don't think we would say, again, that they're being making a bad decision. I think we'd say it's, it's kind of nice that they have a little morning ritual that helps them feel a little bit better about uh, getting out the door. Yeah, yeah. And, and for me, I... Again, I, I was sort of, <laughs> it was this weird position where I studied them, but I was very opposed to them or having them in my life, even though I would have these little things, like little quirks, let's say, in idiosyncratic behaviors like that. But where I noticed I had more of this interest or this appetite to engage in rituals was when my wife was pregnant with our first daughter. And then once she was born, I found myself wanting to include those rituals in, in my interactions with her, which yeah. I know with the work that we've done and, and, and other people who have done is, is that the, the sort of the infant caregiver interactions are highly ritualistic. And it makes sense. Like now that I know that first six months, that first year is absolute chaos and full of uncertainty and, and rituals compensate for that. Yeah, I think we have uh, I have a, a three and a half year old uh, daughter as well. Anyone that has had little kids uh, ever, if you really reflect on what, what you are doing a lot of the time, especially when they're very little, as, as you said, you're actually trying to make rituals for them mm -hmm. that help them do the things that they, that they need to do. So, so bedtime for many kids is an extremely elaborate ritual. You know, it's like, well, first the the bath and there's these two toys and then we have to have the bunny and then we read this favorite book in that chair <laughs> and then mommy comes and we, you know, I mean, they really get pretty elaborate. And with food too, you know, if you think about eating with little kids, we actually intuit that rituals might help them get down that path that, you know, they, they need to get down that. They have to eat and they have to sleep and they have to do all these things. Mm. So we, even people who say, I don't really like rituals, 
they actually often use them if they're trying to get their kids to do stuff. It's like a, a, a tool in our toolkit that we deploy, in, as you said, like in times of uncertainty or unsettled times. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a sociologist, Ann Swidler, that talks about rituals as exactly that. Like we cultures pull out rituals and create new rituals when things are really unsettled. And I think we do that in our personal lives as well. Yeah, totally. I actually, it's funny. I, um, I had a interview last week with, I think it was the Atlantic and then Slate right after this call, I'm hopping on the, the phone with them to talk about gender reveal. Mm -hmm. Um, I guess they're calling it a, a ritual and, and I'm actually, I'm not too sure. And that's what I, I kind of want to flesh out in this conversation I have with this journalist. Um, but the one explanation that I gave is pregnancy and, you know, the, 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 the birth and the labor that's coming, it's, it's highly anxiety inducing. It's, it's, it's unnerving. It's, 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 there's a lot of uncertainty. And when it comes to the reveal of, of sex or gender, I guess the party can be seen as one thing to, to celebrate one, one piece of, of information that can be exposed some degree of certainty that we can uh, revel in and, and celebrate with, with friends and family. So I, I would scoff at, oh gosh, gender reveal parties. I, I think they're hilarious, but, but I'm like, ah, my, the psychologist in me says, you know, it, it actually makes, it actually makes sense. We're just trying to order our environment around us. I have a theory that, you know, there, there is so often in life, there's like two kinds of people, but there's the two kinds of couples, one, one kind who find out the gender and one kind who don't yeah. and couples who want to find out the gender typically think the other people are insane. <laughs> and, and I, and I think that the couples that want to find out the gender I totally agree with you. They're, they're trying to cope with the uncertainty by controlling the one thing that they can, yeah. which is like finding that out. There's not much else you can do, you know, at that point to control things. And so that's why when other people don't do it, those kinds of people say they're crazy. Then the other people say, well, we, we want it to be a surprise. And it's like, it's not really a surprise because it's kind of like a 50, like a coin flip. Yeah, <laughs> lands heads or tails. It's not surprising, really, in particular, but they're trying to do something else to manage it, right? They're trying to get, to keep control of that uh, and not let it go as a way, I think, to cope with just how uncertain and stressful it can be. Yeah, absolutely. And and you know, again, it makes it makes total total sense that these behaviors are exhibited in that in that moment and in that time. Wow. So here we are, seventeen minutes, and we're just nerding out about rituals. So let's let's um, let's pivot a, a little bit. It. You, you're sort of in this, as I see it, this privileged position, this really cool position where you get to straddle a little bit of academia and and practice, um, and and play a big a big role, a big part in this in this up and coming this big sort of behavioral revolution and behavioral insights. Um, how did you find yourself in the position you, you're in? Um, did you sort of have a plan <laughs> 20 years ago as you were going through your graduate school and knew that this was going to come up and Richard Thaler was going to publish this book or, or did you just sort of happen to, to stumble into the, the, the work you're doing now? So, uh, like many, many people stumble is, is much more accurate. So I, um, uh, in college, my, um, randomly assigned freshman year roommate, <laughs> Uh, who became one of my best friends was um, smarter than me and had a, a much better sense of what to do with his life. And so he applied to graduate school in social psychology. And so did I, because, because it seemed like he knew what he was doing. Uh, and so I thought I would do that as well. And um, I deferred for a year because I didn't know if I wanted to do that. Then I went to grad school in, in social psychology then I finished early because I was thinking I didn't want to be in – finished early is not a humble brag. I, I finished early because I wanted to leave and my dissertation is not very good as a result. So I didn't mean that as I'm amazing. Uh, they were nice to let me finish early. Then I left academia for a little bit. And then I met um, through a mutual friend, Dan Ariely, who um, at the time was at MIT. And this is before he wrote um, Predictably Irrational – uh, and um, like like Dick Thaler became sort of larger than uh, we mortal mere mortals, <laughs> yeah. but, but he was my model really for he was doing research that I thought was was so clever and cool, and also instantly could translate to think things in the world so that other academics were interested in what he was doing, but so were smart people everywhere. 
And that, mm -hmm. that really got me. That, that was the thing that I thought, wow, I, I, I could see myself doing that for a long time. And the first thing we worked on actually um, with another student of his at the Media Lab at MIT, Gina Frost, was online dating, which was brand new. That's how old I am. <laughs> it was, this is before Facebook even occurred, even existed. We studied online dating. It was a brand new market. And we thought, oh my God, it's amazing, right? So the, the biggest problem that humans have is finding a partner. And I know it's hard to believe now, but at the time, we really kind of thought online dating would solve it. Like the market would yeah. sort itself out because you'd have all the information and all this sort of stuff. But the idea that we could do research on it uh, which we did, but we also built our own online dating website for MIT students mm. and tried to help connect them to each other and did experiments there as well. Mm. So it just, it really, that's just one example of how, of how working with Dan and, and Gina and being at MIT completely opened my mind, eyes, I'm not sure what the right body part is for that, <laughs> to say that, that I can do these things that I find just so interesting but also maybe some of them would, would be relevant um, to the world as well. Mm -hmm. Not all, but, but some. Yeah. And, and as an aside, I want to get back into <clears throat> that sort of path you're following. But as an aside, I, I sit as a, as a science advisor for a dating app startup. And at first, when I was, when I was approached by this person um, who was really keen, he, did, he, didn't, he doesn't have a behavioral science background, more the entrepreneur uh, in sales. But when he came to me, he's like, I think there's this, I think there's room in this space for behavioral insights. And I was like, yeah, dating app. I'm, I've been married for a long time. I didn't even use dating apps. Mm -hmm. um, and then I, and then I agreed and, and I'm glad I did because in the, over the last year, I've just been doing this deep dive in this and it's just it screams behavioral insights and, and all of the problems with um, that we see in, in, you know, Tinder and all the, the big players, it's, it's like, duh, obvious. It's so obvious why, we're having the problems that we're having and people are struggling finding, you know, finding matches and, and legitimate romantic partners. Um, and there's such, there's so many cool little interventions, you know, that could be coupled with the technology to, to encourage and to incentivize, you know, these good, <laughs> be, uh, you know, relationships. So it's, it's pretty cool space. One of the things that we quickly realized was that most, and to this day, it's true. Most of the online dating websites and apps basically have the same infrastructure as like an app to um, find a TV or find a flight. Mm -hmm. You know, there's like a list of attributes yeah, and then exactly. you click a button and then it gives you some search results. And n number one, boy, that doesn't sound like a good way to find your soulmate <laughs> is to do it like that. But number two, the biggest problem is that at least when you do the flight thing, um, if you find a flight you like, you can just have it. But with online dating, you you do the the search thing, and then you find someone you like. And the problem is that they have to like you back. Mm -hmm. Your flight doesn't have to like you back, <laughs> right? It's yeah. just there. Yeah. Where once the person has to like you back, the exponential difficulty of that match just is astounding, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's almost it it's um, inconceivable that anybody ever matches up in some way, given the math in that. Yes. Which means again, that it's such an interesting area for behavioral science. Yeah. And you guys, I think you guys have a, at least one excellent paper from this work, I guess you were doing is like 2008. There might be a few other papers as well that I'm not aware of, but if I remember that's the sort of position you guys take is that the, the, the interactions that are set up on these platforms and these meeting places are highly transactional as if you're shopping for a flight. Um, when in fact the sort of dynamic that's required for two people meeting and and having this courtship is completely different and requires completely different you know relational dynamics. Yeah, we I remember us talking about you know so most people one of the first things on most on most of the sites um, and it's still this way is you can enter your height preferences for your partner, <laughs> and uh, it it turns out that if you if you think about your uh, your current partner their height is v not very relevant uh, to how well it's going uh, for the two of you, in part because, number one, um, you're often sitting. So it doesn't even matter. You're actually very rarely standing right next to each other, <laughs> facing in some direction. It's quite uncommon. <laughs> Most of the time, you're at work. So the person exists you know, via your phone. So the idea that height somehow would be – I'm not saying it's not okay to have preferences for height. It's fine. But the idea that that would be a central attribute, yeah. given how little a role it plays in an actual relationship, 
shows you that the interfaces can be problematic. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And that's that's where now that I've been doing it for a year, I'm like, holy, this is this is just so ripe for for behavioral insights. Um, excellent. So then <clears throat> you got into that um, with with Dan, and that sort of sold you on it. Opened up your whatever body part, as you said. Um, what were you doing? What sort of work were you doing in your PhD where you didn't necessarily get get that? Um, the 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 thing that I was working on um, uh, mainly as a PhD student was um, the ways that people try to uh, justify and rationalize their their questionable behavior, um, which I I still find uh, very interesting. So we were we were looking in part at uh, how people can make biased decisions like hiring women instead of men and yet really feel like their decision had nothing to do with gender at all. Mm. And I mean, sometimes people are lying about being biased and, and that's fascinating and a problem as well. My particular interest was the, the many, many people who are behaving in this way uh, and we can see it from the outside, but their genuine experience is, no, I, I just hired that guy because he's better. It had nothing to do with his gender, mm. even though we can do the research to show it had a lot to do with his gender. Mm. That kind of um, self-deception, uh, which is what we ended up thinking we were studying, still is quite interesting to me because it happens all the time. Anytime you're doing something that's a little questionable, you can hear in your head these crazy voices that are like, oh, it's fine. Or like, oh, well, everyone's doing it. Literally, they you can hear them in your head when you're struggling with these things. Mm -hmm where do those come from and why do we listen to them and how does that help us walk around feeling like we're super nice people, even when we sometimes do not so nice things. Mm. Well, that, that, that in itself has quite an applied bent to it as, as well. Yeah. We, that one we've gone, there, there's a little bit of research on um, trying to um, help organizations decrease kind of employee theft and cheating and things like that. Mm -hmm. And they're knowing a bit about that internal psychology can be helpful. You can sort of cut people off from some of those excuses. Um, but at the same time, getting people to be, you know, to not steal often the best thing to do is like put cameras in. So there's, you know, there's, there's nudges and behavioral interventions and things. And then there's other things that are just like, now it's impossible to steal. And those turn out to be pretty effective too. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So you, you're in this position um, and in around you know, 2010, 2008, 2010, these books are published. Uh, I believe Harvard's Behavioral Insights Group is established shortly thereafter in collaboration with BIT UK and the first sort of uh, so-called nudge unit. Um, were you surprised to see this growth over the last decade of this field? And again, I, I'm curious to get your perspective as an academic, because a lot of the people you know I've spoken with and will be speaking to on the show are on the other side of the fence. So, are you seeing it through um, through a similar lens, or what? What do you make of the this, this so called behavioral revolution? I think that um, the the key the key starting points for the whole thing were were two two books i think actually one was uh directly uh malcolm gladwell's um first big book the tipping point mm. uh and the other was um in a in a less direct way at first uh michael lewis's moneyball mm -hmm. so gladwell um i guess a lot of social scientists feel like have mixed feelings about about him i've always said that all of us should sort of um, donate a portion of our earnings to him because he <laughs> he um, really uh, was able to um, articulate in such a compelling and intelligent way uh, a lot of the interesting findings from social psychology and from psychology um, in general. We as social scientists knew them, but were completely unable, I shouldn't say completely, we were often unable to translate them in a way that um, made sense to people and was useful to them. Mm -hmm. So, so there with, and then, then an explosion of books like that, that were kind of translating behavioral work into the real world. And then at the same time, Michael Lewis, you know, with Moneyball, a part of a, a real shift in organizations in general in um, using data. 
uh, stop stopping relying on intuition mm -hmm. you know well we know who to hire and we know what customers like and etc and starting to actually say you know what well, we need to use our intuition to make decisions for sure but but why don't we collect the data why don't we decide what data to collect why don't we collect it why don't we analyze it and why don't we use that to inform our decisions mm -hmm. and once you're there it's a very close step to say hey, what kind of data should we collect and if you have humans as your uh, stakeholders, you probably want to collect psychological and behavioral data. And so that also, those two streams together, I think, really led to an interest in it. And then, you know, um, Danny Kahneman winning a Nobel um, for his uh, work with Amos Tversky. And then a little after that, Dick Thaler winning um, his, his Nobel as well for all of his work. That That's just the... Um, uh, the snowballing effect in, in a sense that um, has, con I think, continued to this day. I guess it'll crest. Snowballs don't crest, <laughs> but you know what I mean? Yeah. It will peter out uh, at some point, but we're not, we're certainly not there yet. A lot of organizations are really interested in how they can think about using behavioral science as they define it to help them make better decisions. Totally. And to pause on that, those, those books, I suppose, in these, these events, it's, it's actually interesting. I've never, I've never thought about Moneyball or or Tipping Point as the as the precursors to this movement, or at least precursors to this to these other books. Everyone, and even myself included, like everyone I've always talked to, it's like, yeah, it's it's predictably rational, it's nudge, it's thinking fast and slow. Um, and these and these sort of books in around that 2008 to 2012 period, but it's and I just quickly googled while you were, while you were mentioning those books. Tipping Point was published in 2000, and um, Michael Lewis's book was published in 2003. So that yep. suggests that these it's perhaps and and I buy it. I think I think your logic, which is like here are these guys who aren't trained behavioral scientists. Um, and yet, obviously, very smart guys who have who are excellent communicators and excellent writers who are able to do that translational work um, and put it into into the the, the the mainstream put it into the into the layperson's lap um, that's that's I, I do buy that that's great and then <clears throat> so here we are and there's all this hype and sort of this is part of the 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 motivation for for doing this podcast was it, it's high time to to talk to people to, to take stock to see where we are um, are we at risk of petering out or um, will this last? Is this just a fad? And I think the answer to those questions will help us to ensure that we have some longevity in, in the game, not just in academia, of course, which we always will, but, but outside of academia. Um, have you seen, do, do you see glimpses of that out there in the market with organizations? Do you see that happening, that it's, it's promising or are we sort of at risk? I think that um, the the shift to data is um, permanent. So uh, there's there's no no going back uh, on data now. Now whether it's used correctly or not, we can talk about. But just the idea that uh, we have so much more data, just as a matter of of um, reality where with things online, we just have all the data about people we could ever want. So that's there. Mm. Uh, and that that shift is, I, I can't imagine going backward and probably only will continue to go forward. The idea that um, behavioral insights are required uh, is related to that, but they're not, not the same thing. So some organizations, um, feel, for example, that experiments are really required and necessary to really learn. Other experiments feel that if you have all other organizations feel that if you have all the data, you don't need to do experiments. You can analyze the data. Mm. There's, there's truth to both. I, I don't have a strong position on that. But any organization that says, "Hey, experiments are are useful. We should actually test for causal relationships between." whatever we're doing, varying our price discounts or varying our employee perks or varying whatever else we want to vary. That's where behavioral scientists have a really, I think, unique, um, I guess I'd say competitive edge. We're better at that, at designing experiments, I think, than anybody else. We're not necessarily better at analyzing data or, or other things that are important, mm -hmm. but that is our, our sweet spot. And I don't think experiments are going away 
either because once organizations have adopted the mindset of experimentation, then it's much, much easier to continue to do them and it gets less uh, costly to continue to do them as well. Especially if you have those smart, <clears throat> you know, if it's PhD students, maybe not, um, who have some experience in designing those experiments and knowing, knowing the pitfalls and, and, and doing them properly um, and not screwing up. Um, so, so then we have behavioral scientists who are being trained in graduate school and PhD, like sort of the back, the, the training that you and I had, do you see that as still necessary to, to bring these people into organizations or can we just, can we bypass the five, six plus years and get these people right out of undergrad, maybe masters, um, and get them right into industry designing real world experiments and save them a lot of time, save them a lot of money without, without having to do the PhD. I think that, um, at least in my experience, most organizations that have, have worked, have, have tried to do experiments and have tried to integrate academics, people with academic training, uh, find in moments of candor, I think they would say they find me and all of us, um, frustratingly ignorant probably, but, um, with some unique lens on things. And so we're, we're often, we don't get it, you know, in a sense, we don't, we don't get the full picture of what an organization is trying to accomplish uh, often, not always, but often but we do get humans. Mm. And I, and I do think that um, anyone can learn how to do an experiment. You know, you just change the color from red to blue and randomly assign people to look at it. There's your experiment, but deciding what to test is actually where the insight really, really comes from. And that's something that I don't, I don't know if you need a PhD in X or Y, but you need to have been trained, I think for a long time, in seeing the world like that. Mm -hmm. I don't know if it's osmosis or what, but you, you know, and you've seen that, that the very best behavioral scientists, you know, yeah, I'm sure they're great at designing experiments, but even in conversation, they have a different lens into people than, than other folks. It's not the best or only lens, but it's a very unique lens. And I do think for most things, there has to be some immersion with people who do that so that you can sort of pick it up from them and carry it forward yourself. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> you have a, a, a recent paper, I believe it was just published with a couple other co-authors. Um, and it's extending this idea of, of nudging, not just what we, which we all know. Um, but you guys, you guys call it budging, budging beliefs. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. What do you think? What was the, what was the inspiration for that paper? Um, do you think nudging has gotten us to this point and now we need to begin to look at more mechanistic explanations of, of how we do behavior change? Um, and do you think sort of the nudging part has, has fallen a bit, a bit short? Anyways, what's the inspiration for the, for that, that paper, which is a great paper, by the way. The, um, so this is a, um, a, the idea for the paper and, and the terminology were um, my former postdoc, Oliver Hauser, to give um, full credit. I think the idea was, one of the ideas came from this interesting fact. So I reviewed a paper that was a failed replication of a study trying to show that um, social norms would change people's uh, environmental behavior. This is a, a fantastic paper by Noah Goldstein uh, and Bob Cialdini from a few years ago. If you tell people, hey, 75% of people reuse their towel uh, in, in you, you put signs in hotel bathrooms. Hey, did you know that everyone reuses their towels? More people are likely to reuse their towels and not get it washed, and it's good for the environment. Uh, the replication um, failed, so they didn't show any effect of social norms. If you look at the paper, actually, what happened is, uh, now I forget what country it was, but the country was like Denmark or something like that. Germany. Could be Germany. Yeah, you might be right. Where the the rate of towel reuse was already incredibly high. So Noah and Bob, and Bob were doing an experiment in a place where the rate was extremely low of towel reuse, and the replication occurred in an environment where the rate was extremely high. Now, to say that social norms change behavior, 
Um, that's not true. It depends on what the current social norm is. And, and so it, it's not really a, a failed replication. It's just not the right intervention for that context. So if 90% of people, let's say, are already reusing their towels, telling people that 75% of people are reusing them will not increase their behavior, right? Because they're already up past, past that, that percent. And just the idea that, um, you know, people will say, let's do, let's use anchoring or, or let's use uh, social norms or let's use this. That's not how humans work, right? So the, you can't just apply seven uh, official nudges in any situation and get results. You have to understand what's happening in the situation, which means you have to understand the people in the situation. And that's where you start to get the idea that like, wait, wait, before we do this, let's actually think about what's going on here. So when we say mechanisms and things like that, all we really mean is what are people up to? Uh, and let's design the intervention around that and see if we can design something that actually has an impact on people. It might be social norms. Social norms are awesome, but it, it often is not social norms. And we need to think more deeply about the, the context in order to design the intervention. So we're just trying to make a very simple point, I think, about starting with the people instead of starting with the toolkit. Right. And to your point right. and to your earlier, point, I think earlier, I think this is where you can benefit from, having, you somebody, from having somebody, whether they're trained or not, or not, or not, who are experts in who are behavior, experts. who can get at that level of that nuance or that granularity. Um, and and that that understanding that there's going to be differences in context, differences in culture, differences in environment. Um, so again, whether that person is trained formally or has that in some through through industry experience, having a team where you have at least a few people or a good number of people who have that level of expertise is it seems to be required. Otherwise, you're just you're grasping at straws, throwing spaghetti at a wall, seeing what sticks, and just running with that, not knowing exactly what's actually happening. That's right. And like all things in life, some people are just naturally brilliant at understanding humans. Like some people are, some people are naturally amazing at being salespeople, but, but they're hard to find. So you, you kind of want to find people who are trained to understand humans or who are trained to sell because they're often going to, there's more of them and they're often going to be a huge source of insight uh, for mm -hmm. you. Great. A couple more questions, if you don't mind. First sure. one, which <clears throat> I asked this to to uh, to a couple others, and, and I believe Michael Sanders uh, said that you would definitely be a rock star. But I'll ask you the question, which is, if you weren't if you weren't uh, doing what you're doing now, what 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 do you think you'd be doing? Uh, now I'm tempted to. I want to say something different just to show that Michael was wrong. But no, he is uh, unfortunately uh, correct. My my. Alternate self it would be a, a musician uh, because um, so the, the thing I like most about academia actually is the collaboration. Uh, so I love to work with new people and brainstorm new ideas. And by doing that, you get to know other people's brains and then you, you learn, you just learn a lot doing that. And with music is another form where when you're playing in a band or whatever context, the improvisation uh, and and learning and challenging is is not so dissimilar. It's way cooler, but it's not so dissimilar from brainstorming new ideas uh, in groups. And so they have that same element of uh, connection to other people and riffing literally uh, off of other people's ideas. That, that for whatever reason, for me, that's my favorite thing to do uh, in the world. And so if I weren't doing it in academia, I would definitely be if, if I were good enough, I would definitely be doing it uh, with music instead. I remember the first time we'd met in person, I had come down for a, a big conference workshop day thing. <clears throat> and I came to your office and this is in the, the hallowed halls of, of HBS. And I, and, and I walk in and, and you're, I thought you'd be wearing like a tuxedo or something and, and, and be <laughs> at this marble desk. You were wearing, um, if I remember just a, a flannel with shorts and flip flops. And I, I remember a guitar, two guitar apes or like a guitar in the corner. I was like, Oh my God, this, is this what academia is like? <laughs> well, you have to put things in your office to show that you're an interesting person because we're so boring. <laughs> so you have to scatter things around that imply you're interesting. You know what I mean? So you're compensating. 
<laughs> basically, yeah. <laughs> okay, so and last question for you is uh, what I ask all my guests uh, on the show is the uh, the BBB or the Big Behavioral Brainstorm. And uh, of all the problems we're we're currently facing, which seems to be many um, for us human species, where do you see behavioral science or behavioral insights um, being of, of of most use? Um, my um, biased answer, because it's an interest of mine, but I, I think there's been an incredible amount of amazing research um, on the effects of inequality on all sorts of outcomes, from individuals to companies to cultures to all sorts of things. And it seems to me that it's, it's obviously a macro um, issue in the world. Uh, most people aren't comfortable with how unequal things are right now. I think the idea that social scientists can um, better document the effects of inequality on the outcomes that most people care about is it's not low hanging fruit. It's very difficult research mm -hmm. to do, but I think it could have a huge impact uh, on policy. And the way that showing that markets can be efficient way back in the 50s and 60s had a huge impact on policy showing that inequality can have these really negative effects can have a huge impact on policy as well. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, we just uh, came out of our election, our federal election in Canada last night. I saw. Yes, a very uh, sort of a liberal minority, um, but uh, not not too exciting of, a, of, of, a, of an election. But here we are, and hope, hopefully... Hopefully there's more of that sort of work that's being done and more of that, um, more mandates and budget for that. And, and I know we we now have in the Privy Council in Canada and, and across the different provinces, our, diff our different nudge units, um, which is, I, I believe the count now is is over 100 nudge units in different governments around the world. Um, mm -hmm. So it's important work that needs to be done. Uh, and hopefully there's more of us uh, doing that, doing that work. So, well, we're at uh, we're over time, I believe, by my count. But uh, Mike, really, uh, really great to chat and catch up and talk all things from circumcision to um, inequality. And uh, th thanks for coming on. Thanks, Nick, for thinking of me. Hey, Nick here once more. A final farewell note before ending. All the show notes, links to papers, resources, and materials mentioned in the episode can be found on the BS Podcast page of The Behaviorist, where you can find all episodes and lots of other interesting, easy-to-apply, sciencey stuff. Just go to www.behaviorist.biz slash BS Podcast. And lastly, if you'd like to join me in the mission of spreading the good BS word, remember to rate and review the show on iTunes. Why should you? Because one, you're a part of a digital-wide social proof exercise. Two, you're helping combat the negativity bias in the form of positive reviews. And three, it's a little pre-commitment for your habitual podcast listening. A little investment to keep you coming back for more BS. I mean, how much more behavioral can you get? Thanks again for listening. Until next time, remember, keep your facts ugly and your hypotheses beautiful.